Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll hang on there. We're just filling up. Okay, so we're going to kick things off. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in our series of webinars for the MOVE conference. Um, my name is Cormac Cronin Martin. I'm the conference director for the MOVE series. And joining me today, uh, we've got a really, really great treat. We've got um, Henri Moisenac, who's the CEO and co-founder of DOT, a very exciting micromobility company. And um, Henri is going to be talking to us about um, some lessons learned at the moment and how micromobility can help during uh, COVID-19. Good afternoon, Henri. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. <coughs> Great. Great to have you with us, Henri. Um, so just a note on the structure. So we're going to have um, about 10 to 12 minutes. It's going to be quite a, quite a snappy to the point lessons learned piece. Um, so do, uh, do join in and once that's finished, we will have a great opportunity to have a Q&A with Henri. So do make sure that you're submitting your questions um, in the questions tab, and we should have time to get around to those. And um, yes, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Henri. Well, um, well, uh, shall I share my screen? Let me do this. Yes. Can you see my screen? Um, just having it now only, yes. Great. Okay, so this works, right? I see the screen. So thank you so much uh, for setting this up. We are very happy to share a bit more about uh, DOT. I'll say a few words about DOT, what we've been doing the COVID crisis. I also want to take some, of, uh, some time to um, talk about the lessons learned and how we see uh, micromobility change over time uh, because of this crisis. Um, so we are at this magic moment, independently of the COVID crisis, where transportation is a pain for everyone. Either you use overcrowded public transit, or you're trying to use your personal car or your personal motorcycles, uh, but it's getting almost impossible to ride uh, because of congestion and parking issues. And at the same time, cities want to cut down on pollution and emissions. And so for the last three, four years, there's been this massive rush towards micromobility services, whether it's mechanical bikes, electric bikes, shared scooters, private initiatives, all types of things. And looking at this market of about uh, hundreds of millions of trips in Europe, uh, 30 minutes typical trip in public transit. So this is, for example, from my place to the office in Paris. It's about 30 minutes if I take the metro. It's 16 minutes in the middle of the night if I take an Uber or 45 minutes during the day because of congestion. I can take my bike, it's 20 minutes. I can also take a, a, a scooter, it's about 20 minutes and it's going to be virus free. And so this is, the, this is the market we're looking at. It's a humongous number of trips and it's changing dramatically fast thanks to micromobility. So what we do at DOT is we're trying to open up cities with clean mobility for everyone. And what we do is we uh, dispatch we dip throughout the city uh, scooters, like the one you see on the, on the screen. We are currently operating scooters, but we are soon going to launch an e-bike. You have a mobile app, like the one you see on the screen. You can see where the scooters are, you can walk them, and then you can unlock them thanks to, the, thanks to your mobile phone. And it's people riding about three kilometers for about two to three euros. They love it. They say it's flexible, it's fast, it's clean, it's affordable. They are a bit concerned about uh, safety at first, but after 10 or 20 rides, they really get used to it and it becomes a lot of fun. And it's, it's really the planet, it's carbon free, there's no emission. And on top of that, thanks to the crisis, 
Now people are even more concerned and they see it as a virus free uh, with distancing and a safer alternative to public transit. So a few words about the company. Uh, I'm coming from Silicon Valley. As in Silicon Valley, I was an early employee at eBay, Facebook, at Uber. I had a great run over there and I learned a lot of things about hyper growth and how to deploy Silicon Valley models throughout the world. And my co-founder is coming from operations manufacturing. He spent a lot of his time in China and Southeast Asia. And we are surrounded by a team from mobility, from Uber, from Lyft, uh, from people that are doing embedded software at Tesla and TomTom, people that are coming from Dale at Decathlon and Wayfair, and people that are coming from mobility, whether it's transport for London, Mobike and Ofo. And we are basically trying to combine the best of Silicon Valley with the best of Europe and the best of manufacturing and operations. And this is working well. Our secret sauce at DOT is a combination of this. One, we do 100% of everything we do in-house. This is a very different model from the Lime, the Bird, the Uber, and some of our European competitors. We do everything in-house. We can trace everything. We don't have any contractors. We don't have any blind spots. We can optimize and we can get best quality at the highest efficient uh, cost. The second thing is we work very hard to provide a reliable, consistent product for end users. Winter and summer throughout the city, air, in a smart way, so it's really reliable. It has the base maintenance. It's everywhere, it's available. And this wins users over time. And the third thing is we've been very disciplined on how we go to market. We didn't rush to market. We didn't deploy hundreds of cities and we become very capital efficient. So just a few words about each of them. Our operations, so 100% of our operation is done in-house. The charging ops, all these people you see on the photo, they're employees of DOT. The repairs, the predictive maintenance, everything is done in-house. It's all standardized, it's all formalized, it's all traced, and we optimize very well all of it. And the street patrols and the rebalancing, again, all in-house for best quality and best reliability. And that model is very scalable. We've deployed everywhere in France, Italy, Germany, and Belgium. A few words about our product. So we try to provide a great ride it's the great hardware, but also a great maintenance. Maintenance is very important to sustain the quality. And we have an excellent reputation on that. We try to make it always available, rain or shine, winter and summer, throughout the city. We work very hard on parking, on deployments, how it spreads throughout the city so it becomes a reliable experience. And then we make it as affordable as possible. We have, for example, these weekly passes, five rides for five euros, or weekly passes for 15 euros. And when it's affordable like this, it becomes as easy to use and as affordable as public transit. And in terms of go to market, we do one city at a time. Today we're in 10 cities in Belgium, France, Germany, and Italy. We do every city in a responsible way. We are very steady. We do a great job at it. And most of the time when we enter a city, after a few months, we become number, number one or number two player in terms of ridership and in terms of quality. So excellent go-to-market for that. So I want to talk about COVID. Three things today. What's our position on this? All the things we've done and some of the results and the lessons learned. First, our position is that from the get-go, we decided we wanted to operate and we maintain service in every city we operated before the crisis. This was really important for the founders and it was really important for all the employees. When I go to the pharmacy, when I go to the butcher or the bakery, they want to operate. They want to continue service the community. We decided we would do the same. So we worked very hard to upgrade our operations. We trained everyone and we made sure it works. So for example, this is a pharmacy employee in Italy. She's more than happy to use a dot to deliver. And then on the right, you have the Italian police that is using a dot inside Turin every day. We did a lot of initiatives in order to adapt for the crisis. So first of all, we protected our teams. We trained everybody uh, to, uh, we changed our processes. We worked on sanitizing all our scooters. We clean our scooters entirely every 10 rides, but on average, it's more or less every five or seven rides. We work with communities. We reached out to every hospital, every healthcare, every charity. We offered free rides. And we even deployed custom geofence. For example, this is on the right-hand side. 
in the south of Lyon, you have this custom uh, geofence just for hospital. And you have all the people, all the staff of the hospital that can run around throughout the hospital uh, using dots anytime and for entirely free. And we are very, very proud of it. I can tell you a lot of our employees were super proud and super eager to make it work. And then the third thing, the results. So just a few uh, uh, data, if that uh, can be interesting to you. The first one is we saw that we got a lot more regular usage, a lot more usage that looks like commute. So for example, one third of our riders, they do more than four rides per week and they confirm this is to and from their workplace. We have much longer trips than before, three kilometers and more. We have much more trips to and from hospital. On the right hand side, you see all our trips in Paris and the orange uh, 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 boxes are the French hospitals and we are tracking all of that. We're also deploying more next to hospitals than we used to do before. But the most important part to us is all these messages of love. You have no idea how many messages we get through email, uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, everybody's reaching out, everybody's thanking us. We are really part of the fabric. And when we talk to our friends that work in the medical uh, systems on the front lines, and we know we're helping them, we're very, very proud of that. Looking forward post the COVID crisis, we think it's an opportunity. So obviously we're very sad with what's happening throughout the world. Uh, we are very sorry for all the families, all the businesses that have such hard times. Specifically for micromobility, we think it's an opportunity. We are trying to look at the glass half full versus half empty. Short term, micromobility is going to become a very, very strong alternative to public transit. Will people want to ride crowded public transit? Probably not. Will they want to use their cars and go back in congestion and traffic jam? Probably not. They will bike, they will bike, they will use scooters, they will use shared services, they will buy their own hardware. The world is going to change much faster. And so we're looking at this as massive transition from public transit and private cars to micromobility. Midterm, we think this is going to fast forward infrastructure. Things that take four years in Paris, such as planning a bike lane and building it, now is taking four weeks. In four weeks from now, we're going to have temporary bike lanes in Paris just like they were planning in four years from now. And it's the same in Brussels, it's the same in Milan, it's the same in Munich, it's the same in every city we've been talking to. We are going to see a widely increased infrastructure for bicycling. This is magic. And then the third thing, long term, I think this is going to become a new freedom. It's like micromobility, whether it's private or shared, is like the cars of the 60s. Remember these times? Your parents, your grandparents were buying a car for individual freedom and they could just walk around, drive around, but they had a lot of pain, they created a lot of pollution, they created a lot of congestion. And micromobility is going to create that freedom again for people without the pain, without the pollution, without the congestion. So we see this long-term trend. It's a massive market, massive opportunity, and we're very happy to serve it. And this is our team in Paris, and they're all happy to support everyone every day. So thank you very much for your time, and I'm more happy now to answer some of your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Henri. That was very, very interesting. And um, uh, such, such um, you know, a two-part story, the operations in-house side and, and the business setup, but also then uh, how the business is uh, operating during COVID. Um, we have had some questions come in. Um, so I guess I'll go to the first one that we have here. Um, and that's from Tad Oviad, and he's asked, um, have any charging stations appeared in public for micromobility? So there's been discussions across many cities to do charging stations. They do exist already. So for example, certain the bikes in London, these are docking stations and they can be upgraded for charging. If you look at the docked uh, scheme in Paris called Veli, all charging stations for electric bikes, the cities are quite eager to do so, and there were supposed to be some proof of concepts for free services with both docked free floating, but these, these types of projects have been postponed post the virus, and we will be very excited to participate into this. Absolutely, and, and how do you think the outlook will be for that post-corona? Post so I think the, the, combi the, the, the speed at which the cities will change their infrastructure towards 
microservices, whether it's to serve uh, shared services like Dart or private ownerships, I mean, private bikes, private scooters, private, you name it, that's going to go much faster. And it's a combination of uh, bike lanes, protected bike lanes, for the riders, specific rules and regulations to protect the pedestrians, for example, around parking, not parking on sidewalk and things like that, and including a better infrastructure, uh, charging stations. Absolutely. You know, that's very interesting because we did actually, um, before the webinar, have a question come in as well. And I thought it really fed into something you said during the presentation. You mentioned that, um, you know, it took just four weeks in Paris to kind of really open up the infrastructure for micromobility rather than four years. Um, now, uh, just before the, the webinar, we did have one coming in saying, you know, there, there's limited space already for pedestrians and cyclists. And where is the safe room for micromobility? And is it really necessary? I mean, what would you say to that question? So I think, I think people, uh, um, you, you need to look at the movie. And an interesting city to look at is Amsterdam. People tend to forget that 30 years ago, Amsterdam was a 100% car city. They weren't any bikes. And this is the perfect example of a city that has changed. And now more than 50% of the trips inside Amsterdam has done, are done on private bikes. And they've been able to find this combination of lanes for cars, parking for cars, and lanes for bikes. And that transition you're going to see everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world is, is not uh, made for one personal car, one passenger, parking and thing, taking 70% of the space. And I think everybody to that, left and right, every city in the world. The question is at which speed are you going to see that? If you go to China, China is also a very interesting example. I, I, you know, I, went to, well, I haven't been to China recently, but if you go to a city like Beijing, for example, you have uh, the, the bike lanes are as wide as the car lanes, and that probably is going to be the future for a lot of European cities. Absolutely, yeah, you see it straight away in Amsterdam for sure. Um, another question come in from um, Kazuhito Azechi, um, and Kazuhito has asked, um, how do you think about revenue and profit during lockdown? So uh, on the revenue side of things, uh, we have seen a huge drop in demand. Uh, for, on average, our cities are doing 90% less trips than they used to do before. And then mm -hmm. looking at the winter, not even the summer. So we have a huge miss in revenues. That is a big concern for ours, but also for any other mobility company. Uh, we've been, because, because we learn from retail how to adapt, uh, whether, you know, a lot of us come from retail and uh, retail has also this type of seasonality with a very good Christmas season, and sometimes a very weak summer season. In mobility, it's a bit the opposite. So we had already baked inside DOT the right principles and the right way of working, but we weren't expecting such a drop. So therefore, we're we are losing more money. We had a choice to down or continue operating the service. I can tell you at no point in time, any employee inside the company recommended shutting down the service, regardless of the loss. We reduced our fleet, we adapted our operations, we trained people, that's obviously additional cost, but we're ready to do it and very proud of doing it. Absolutely. No, that's for sure. And looking across as well, another one that's come in, and it's, it's an interesting one um, from Irene Shapova. Um, is DOT planning to deploy other means of transport, such as e-mopeds, for example? So today we are working on scooters and we'll do it well in 10 cities. We are soon going to try uh, e-bikes and that will be probably at first a small scale and then 2020, uh, big, uh, 2021 bigger scale, we may actually look at other modes. Cargo bikes is one thing where you can put your kids in front. I'm actually quite excited about this. Uh, maybe we'll look at mopeds, but we don't have any plans as of now. Okay. No problem. The questions are really flooding in now. Uh, you must be saying uh, <laughs> things that are kind of tickling the brain for sure. Um, so just moving straight on to the next one. Um, so uh, Benjamin de Tersac has asked, uh, do you believe that user behavior will change after COVID? And uh, will people stop using public transport and in what magnitude? Uh, quite a speculative question, but um, what, what are your thoughts on that only? I think, I think COVID will have mass impact on people's behavior in, in they think of their families, their work, work from home versus work at the office and you same type of changes in mobility. I think you see a surge of purchase of personal bikes, maybe bikes, paper, you know, people will <laughs> rush to the <laughs> store and capture as many bikes as they can. And this will lead to a, um, 
avoid public transit, short distance, they'll walk more, they'll use their own bikes, they'll use shared services. Mm -hmm. Public transit will still be around. You know, it's not like you're going to uh, stop using public transit. At some point, the distance, people in the suburbs, and they will have to take the train. And we need, as a community, to work to ease that so there's not too many people at the same time in public transit. Absolutely. And um, another very interesting one. So obviously, you know, a lot of interesting trends around, um, around the lockdown in some areas. And uh, Mike Manship has asked, are you working with any location analytics companies uh, to determine how to deploy the vehicles to better meet, um, better meet, excuse me, the completely different demand patterns over the COVID period? So we were working uh, with uh, uh, machine learning algorithm and experts to help us deploy in regular times. It was already a bit chaotic between you know, the winter and the summer, the weekends and the weekdays and times of the day and so forth. COVID has completely changed that. You know? mm -hmm. So we went, uh, it, 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 and it's so short in, in four weeks <laughs> and it's changed again with the lockdowns. So we're not using much, much machine learning at this stage. We are back to the basics. So we increase three times the deployments we do next to hospitals. Just that makes a huge difference. Um, Therefore, we reduce deployments elsewhere, by which we need to maintain a minimum level of uh, availability throughout the city. Absolutely. And, and then I guess on the other side of that, um, we've had a question from Scott Colber, who's asked, um, does that have an API that uh, third party aggregators can use to provide dot vehicle avail availability uh, for display in mobile apps and public signage? Yes. So we're working with almost all the mobility as a service uh, um, services that are out there, for example, in Paris, in Brussels. Sometimes it's live, sometimes it's just in beta. For example, we are working with the uh, local uh, metro, it's called RATP in France, mm -hmm. and they have a mobility as a service a beta test with I think two or 3,000 people were in it, we're part of it. So we have a APIs to expose our, and if you have a project around this, please do reach out, you know, just send us your email or you know, find a way to reach me on Twitter or something, and we'll yeah. be happy to talk to you. I'm sure we can um, we can put Scott in uh, in contact with you for sure. And um, then also um, an interesting one here as well from um, Alexandros uh, Tsiampas. Is this uh, regarding the e-bike? Does the current situation make you want to work towards a faster launch? Uh, so we would love to go faster. Uh, we just can't <laughs> do everything at the same time. And just like every other business, you know, some some things have become much harder for us. So yes, we would. We would have wanted to do our e-bike summer, and that one be and uh, many different moving pieces. But boy, I wish I had it to this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, then just an interesting one. In, in, in the presentation, you did talk about um, you know, the sanitization, the cleaning, and, and, and I suppose the rapidity of that. So um, we've had a question, another one, I think, from Irina Shapova. And um, Irina has asked, um, don't you think that the COVID-19 crisis will incentivize people to go back to ownership instead of sharing uh, for health safety reasons? Um, and, and, you know, what are your thoughts on that? So, the, so talk about the, the, the policy, the level of risk, and then private ownership versus shared ownership. So in terms of risk, uh, we, we, uh, we, clean, we clean our scooters every night, and then our partners are also trained to clean the scooters. So on average, scooters every uh, seven rides so i think we will see those, uh, with, uh, with the post lockdowns but uh, we 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 can't uh, clean the scooter on every we we what we, we what we do see is most of the riders now they get the point that they need to wear a helmet they need to pay attention to safety rules on the road not ride on the sidewalk properly park and then extension of wearing gloves pretty straightforward please do wear a helmet and take gloves on and then when you're done please disinfect, uh, wash your hands and disinf disinfect uh, or sanitize your, your phone. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about how fast the, the riders will adapt to uh, uh, wear, wearing gloves. It, it's, it's going to be okay. I think the, the virus will drive people to more private ownership and this is good for shared services because first of all, at every red light, instead of seeing two bicycles and one scooter, you're going to see 20 bicycles and five scooters. And every, everybody can, I can do it myself, you know. It's like, I, I learned to wash my own clothes because I saw my grandmother do it on TV commercials. So I know how to, you know, use the washing machine. It's the same here. These are all going to be ambassadors on how to use bike lanes and 
you know, you can move around. It does work. Even you can do it because all these people do it. And then even the people have their own bikes, they will use shared services. And the reason for that is you don't always take your own bike. Maybe sometimes you have a longer distance, so you take the metro to get there, and on the way back, you take a bike, you know. So it's just a lifestyle change. And, and the point is you're moving from walking my own car or public transit to private or shared electric vehicles. And that's, that's where we are. So it's all good for us. Absolutely. I, I get a sense that some of the people in the chat room who have yet to learn how to clean their clothes might be shifting slightly uneasily in their seats, but uh, avoiding that, um, we do have one in here again from Kazu Hito Azechi, who has asked, um, how do you plan uh, to customize, or do, I think he means, uh, do you have plans to customize Dot Scooter in the future? Um, so the, the, the scooters, they, they have like, I'm thinking he's talking about customization of hardware over time. So we have a, what we call a long development cycle and a short development cycle. So long development cycle, a good example is how the industry went from fixed batteries to swappable batteries. And we are preparing a next generation. I can't talk about it today, but it's going to be as game changing as what you've seen from fixed battery to swappable battery. I can't wait to show it, but I just can't disclose it. And then we have short, uh, short term development cycle. So a good example is for example, if you lived in Paris or if you were living in Germany, uh, you could see how they look almost the same, but they are slightly different. We've improved the anti-theft, some of the software inside for battery management, uh, the IoT, the connectivity. We've even changed the color of the handlebars. <laughs> you know. So it's just like any, it's almost like a car manufacturer. You, know, you have these big generation gaps and then the year there's still some improvement. So our long-term development cycle is a year. And a short-term development cycle is five months. Absolutely. Okay. So plenty to be excited about looking forward then. Um, we do have, again, they're still kind of flowing in here. So we'll, we'll keep going. Um, we've had a question here um, from Adam Tarshis, uh, Tarshis uh, who has asked, um, how do you think cities will react to the migration of commuters uh, from buses and metro to scooters? Uh, he's asking this because they're currently very heavily invested in public transport. So right now, the, we, we are talking to a lot of the local governments, police services, and local city services. They all want to know how we can help flatten the curve of people in public transit. What they want is let riding or move around and push people to stay at home as much and as long as possible, work from home, you know, it will be it will, it will a time. But then they also don't want the public transit to be overwhelmed and too crowded. And so they're all asking us, can you increase capacity? We even have cities that, that reach out to us and say, DOT is not operating in, your, in our city. What would it make? What, what do you need in order to come? And, and so we're, we're going to probably be at maximum capacity, not just us, but all the other players. And this is something that most of the cities are really pushing us to do. Absolutely. And I suppose leading on from that as well, we've had another one asking here, um, how do you think cities' requirements from operators for vehicle hardware and data uh, will be impacted post-crisis? Uh, so the, the, I think in the early days of uh, scooter sharing and bike sharing or electric bike, there were a lot of playbooks. Some of them were very aggressive. I move in, I don't go to the city. Some of them are extremely collaborative, like what we've been doing. We never go in a city without permission. And we share every, all our data is anonymized and share with city ask for anonymized, obviously. We, we SLA, level of repairs, uh, deployment points, what's cold, what's hot, what's working, what's not working. We try to build a very strong uh, relationship with the cities. We have a very, very good relationship. Mm -hmm. What we've seen with COVID, is that this has accelerated that process. And if you look at micro mobility companies, there were really two types of players during the COVID. They were the people that decided to stay regardless of the cost and the challenges of operating the service. We are part of that. And then there are people that deserted. They just left, left everybody, the workers, left the city, and now they're trying to come back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I guess, again, um, we, we've had, um, Kauri Sato here, he's asked the same question a couple of times, so I think we'd better answer it. Um, he has asked, um, as he says, you know, do, do we think that people still want to live in urban areas? Uh, he's talking about, you know, uh, so many people right now are working remotely. Um, and 
uh, do you think that companies, it's I suppose more general question, but do you think companies will be more likely to promote remote work uh, post COVID? Yes, so I, I remember how at some point, everybody was working on a desktop. Mm -hmm. And then we started doing more and more things on our mobile phone, taking photos, exchanging messages, um, um, sending emails. And now you can even, you know, I don't know, Google, Google Slides on your, on your mobile phone. And that, that transition to 10 years. Think of a transition where we would have taken away the desktop for two months. Mm -hmm. It would have accelerated the penetration of mobile. I think this is what's happening right now with COVID and micromobility and work from home. It's going to accelerate people uh, feeling good about working at home. It's going to accelerate collaboration between teams of a video. Uh, it's going to accelerate uh, your transition from, I'm just using my own personal car to maybe a, a, a shared service. And I accelerate my transition from public transit to possible uh, you know, shared services like that. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, moving on as well. Um, we've had a couple of questions here, um, but one specifically about um, expansion to the Asian market. Um, and Kazuhito Azechi is asking if you have the opportunity to do so in the future. So that we're very focused on Europe. Uh, maybe, you know, at some point we, we do other things. Uh, we do have partnerships with other uh, micro-mobility service providers across the world, including uh, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, but it's, you know, right now, there's just so many cities to serve in Europe. Let's just mm -hmm. focus on that, at least for that. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. And um, then uh, just a, a kind of a longer term question we have here. Um, so Edwin Tan has asked, uh, you know, obviously, it's quite a competitive market in micromobility. I mean, how do you see the landscape uh, in Europe trending towards uh, where, where do you see it trending towards in the next year or two? And, and how do you see dot two years from now? So to me, so I was lucky to uh, participate as a young uh, intern and then a small entrepreneur in the e-commerce uh, uh, wave, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in 2000. And, and micromobility is a bit the same. In 2000, it was super easy to just uh, pump, you know, launch a website and start delivering product. And then as soon as you got to some scale, it became a nightmare. And if you look 20 years later, there's only a few companies that do it well. And they're extremely well known. And these are companies that were extremely meticulous in everything they did since the beginning. Micromobility is the same. Uh, when we launched in Paris, we were the 10th player to launch. And we thought there were many clowns and many serious companies there. But everybody thought, oh, it's such a crowded market. You have no chance and so on. And look, look a year later, we're the only, we were the only operator to operate in Paris for a while uh, during the, the, the virus because we are the only one to be able to sustain the operation. It was the same during the strikes. A lot of the players just could not sustain the, the, the level of operations. So I think it's going to be the same. Many companies at first, because it looks simple, I just take my credit card, I fly to China, I buy 5,009 bolts, I deploy it, and oh, it's going to be magic but it's so much harder than that. And only the meticulous serious players will, will sustain. And what you see right now is this acceleration of uh, the, 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 the people that went too fast, rushed and didn't do well, they're, they're weaker. And the people that did it in a meticulous, steady growth way, they're doing stronger. Absolutely, very, very much in line with how, how um, we think about these things. Sustainability is king. Um, Another few questions that we had um, come in before the webinar. So, I mean, one um, which I was quite interested in as well, to be honest, um, just right now during, um, during the lockdown and during COVID, um, how is the ridership profile changing? I know you covered some of it in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the presentation, but in terms of the ratio, say, of leisure uh, use to essential workers, um, you know, what, you know, what's the profile breakdown there and, and how does this affect your operations? Yeah, so I think there were really, so far, three, three phases. In 2018, we, we did not operate, but we know from our, 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 some of our friends that are with other players, 2018 was really a tourist thing. You know, it was all the Americans coming to Paris, all the cities coming out. 2009, start to have this like much more local uh, usage and a good combination of weekend and weekdays, but it's never a commute thing. It's just like sometimes I use it maybe and, and now with the COVID, most of our traffic right now are people that are going to work or coming back from work. And they, you can see them doing the same trip every day, two ways, and four times a week. 
and I think that, so when, when people can go out again and see their friends and so on, it's going to get again back all over the map with yeah. all types of usage, including the weekend. But I think the, the COVID crisis has made a few people and post crisis also post lockdowns as people free public transit. I think uh, micro mobility services, e-bikes, um, scooters, whether they're private or shared will, will become much more part of the daily commute. There is one question in the chat about affordability and whether uh, the question is, do you think people can afford such expensive ways of transport after losing their job? I was just so, going to come on to that. I didn't want to, uh, to avoid it. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So it's a very important question. So we're, we're working very hard to make it affordable. Um, so for example, in Paris, the average fare for DOT is about 240 euros. Mm -hmm. It's only a tiny fraction more than the pay as you go price for a metro or bus ticket. Uh, obviously, it's never going to be as cheap as subsidized public transport, but it's, mm. not, it's not really far. We're not talking about an Uber ride or a taxi ride. We're working on subscriptions. We're working on ways to make it affordable for people to use it four days a week. The vision we have is you can use Dot or your own private bike eight times a week, four days a week, two trips, and half of that would be on your private bike, half of that would be on shared services, and we want to be as affordable as public transit. Absolutely, absolutely. And I have one more here that did come in um, before before the webinar, and I think maybe uh, um, could potentially be a good way to wrap things up. Um, you know, in terms of uh, future proofing micro mobility uh, to really make sure that it that it you know gains a hold in society as as it has. But um, the question was, how do we future proof the integration of micro mobility into public transport when both operators and cities are financially stretched? So. Mobility is part of the fundamental services everybody needs. And so I'm convinced that uh, the population, the people will make it work one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the, the long-term integration is probably this kind of uh, weekly or monthly or annual passes where you can ride public transit and you can also ride uh, shared services and they work together. It's, it's a simple user experience. It's also affordable for everyone. That's, that's the long-term vision, and we're working towards that. How long will it take? A year, two years? I don't know, but we're definitely on our way there. Absolutely. Um, as I said, I think that's probably the best place to wrap things up now. Um, so a big thank you, Henri. I think it's been very interesting and very enlightening, and uh, judging by the number of questions that came in, definitely got some heads uh, some heads uh, whirling, as it were. But um, yeah, if you want to let everyone know the best way to get in touch with you after the webinar. So you can find me on Twitter at uh, my last name, Moisinac. Or you can send me an email at henry with an i at ride.com. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, listen, thanks again, Henri. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, to the wider community, we will be uh, putting on a couple more webinars on May 5th and May 6th. So do keep an eye out for the information on those. And you can find that on our social media uh, channels and also on our website. But um, Henri, thank you very much and speak again. Thank you very much, everyone. It was great to meet you all. And thank you for the questions.